Every birth is special to somebody. Just ask the Ridges and the Parsons today who now have new grandbabies born on the same day two days ago or yesterday, whatever it was. Every birth special to somebody. Interestingly enough, every child Beautiful to somebody, not to everybody, right? Sometimes you go, whoa. <laughs> Sometimes you go, wow. But they're special. Sadly, not every birth is special to the right people. One of the greatest stains on the history of our country is legalized abortion. What a terrible, terrible blight on the country of America. And just like people want to kill unborn or even newborns that also happened when Jesus was born. But while every birth is special to somebody, only one birth was special. For in that birth, God appeared. God appeared. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 9 and verse 26 that now at the end of the ages, Christ appeared, sacrificing himself. He appeared. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3 and in verse 16, one, the part of the mystery of godliness is that God was manifested in the flesh. The word manifested means it was awesome and it was brilliant. It's built on the word for light and it said it revealed something, it showed something. It meant something. It meant that God was here. Luke would say in chapter 7, God visited his people. The word visited literally could be he tabernacled. This passage in John 1. The Word became flesh and dwelt, or as the original says, tabernacled among us. Indicating when He did come here. At the Feast of Tabernacles. When the Jews would dwell in booths to remember their time dwelling in tents in the wilderness, they tabernacled in the fall of the year when Jesus tabernacled among us. In John 1, at the beginning of that chapter, we get it all put together. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Nothing was made without Him. All things created by Him. And that Word became flesh 
and tabernacled among us. God appeared. The concept is not really new. If you ever read or heard or saw any of the mythology of the Greeks, that's what it was all about, wasn't it? Mythology was about gods coming into the world of mankind. But it wasn't the same, was it? In, that, in those mythology stories, mythological legends, the, these gods who supposedly rule created these gods from among the men and women to live there. The gods, supposedly, who ruled had all the same vices and problems that the human race had. Therefore, every god that they created from amongst them had the same problems and struggles and trials. They were not perfect. They were all imperfect. But the concept that God came was, has been planted in the hearts and lives of people from early on. So it's not new. The thought that God would appear, but it is new. And never again repeated that God would appear the way that he did. For, in the form of God, and yet human, Jesus was born into the world. How could it be that three in one, become one in the world. God, through the Spirit, brought Jesus into the world. God appeared. He wants, therefore, to be known. He appeared to say, not just I am here, for all of creation loudly says that. Just look at creation and deduce properly and logically to understand that all things exist because something created them. And the idea that God exists is evident in the creation. But God didn't just appear <coughs> to be known to exist. He appeared to say, I don't want you to know me in existence. I want you to know me in relationship. I want to live among you. I want to be like you. And I want you to experience me. And often Jesus would say, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So what about all of those people that both Matthew and Luke mention somehow connected with the birth of Jesus. What happened with them when God appeared for a few minutes? Think about this. When God appeared, the wise men 
rejoiced. Matthew chapter 2. The wise men rejoiced. Why? Why? Well, the text says they had seen the star in the east and they came to worship him. Okay, why? There doesn't seem to be in the astrological, the astronomy, astronomical re, uh, records any particular new thing that happened. No alignment of planets, no new star. What was it? Don't know. However, there was something that they were looking for. Both Tacitus and Suetonius, Greek historians, about 60 or 70 years after the event, were writing, and they made it known that everybody around the world was looking for some new event connected to the king of Jews. This was something that everybody was expecting, even these men from the Far East. Where did they get it? Well, Numbers 24, when the prophet Balaam is called in to curse the people of God by a heathen king, instead he blessed them. And in that blessing, Balaam said, a star shall rise out of Judah and a scepter from Israel. From those words, people were expecting something, a star, to come out of Judah. People who understood accurately historical time, who read Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 through 27, accurately knew that the time was near, <clears throat> that something special was about to happen. For those verses clearly show that what happened at that particular time of the first century was well documented and clarified in prophecy of a special event that they were already looking for, ready for it to happen. And I think certainly at least in a miraculous way, God used a star to guide them where they were going. And they rejoiced because this great event, this great event that they had been looking for to mark an epic time in history, they honored it because they were people of history and they appreciated it. <clears throat> Number two, when God appeared, Herod was troubled. Oh, this bothered him. It bothered him. I imagine he learned about it because these wise men who came certainly would want to know from the king, where is he? Surely this great event has happened, and you, the current ruling person in the area, you would know about it. I'm going to go ask. Oh, he was troubled. I find it interesting that the text says, and all Jerusalem was troubled as well. Maybe the Jews were looking for a king. I think they were. They didn't get the one they wanted. But they were looking. But Jerusalem was troubled because Herod was troubled. And Herod was troubled because, wait a minute, a king? You mean he's going to displace me? He's going to take my place? 
I don't want that. And he reached out to try and stop this king from developing into adulthood. Of course, it didn't work. But he was troubled because it was a threat, a threat to him. Third, when God appeared, when God appeared, the shepherds preached. I was challenged earlier to answer a question, and I believe I found it. Alfred Edersheim, Hebrew scholar, historian, says that the Mishnah, which was the writing of the Jews about the second century, writing about their laws and about their culture and about their life, he makes this statement. These were not just shepherds. They were not shepherds who looked for a manger. He says that the Greek actually means and says, according to them, the manger. Interestingly enough, these shepherds, keeping watch in the fields, what were they watching over? The flocks. He says that these flocks were the temple flocks. The ones that they matured and had ready for the hordes of people coming in from afar in order to observe and to offer their sacrifices when they came. They didn't bring, bring the animals with them. They brought money from having sold their animals at home and now they could come and exchange this money for the lambs that they were going to sacrifice. So the shepherds were taking care of the temple sheep when the great shepherd appeared. And in the place there where they were, when it came time to slaughter the lambs, they had a place called the manger, which was a narrow place in the rocks, where they would put the lamb to swaddle it. It was a tightened enclosure that would calm the lamb before the slaughter. Are you tracking with me? When these shepherds confronted those angels from heaven, this whole event was special to them. And now they preached. They went out and told everybody what was happening. And when they returned from preaching about it, they were rejoicing and glorifying God for the event because they saw in the history of the Jewish people the sacrificing of the lamb, and now at the manger, God appeared. When God appeared, the people to whom they preached marveled. This word means they were awestruck 
to the point of beginning to talk about what it means. They were having conversations among themselves, these people. What is this? These men have told us what's going on. What is it? And maybe without faithfulness to the text of Scripture, they talked among themselves. What does it mean? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? And therefore, they were thinking, this is a great event. It's more than what it seems. Not sure what it is, but it seems bigger than just a normal event. They marveled. <coughs> when God appeared, Simeon, Simeon praised God. Simeon rejoiced. Simeon was thankful. He was the priest serving in the temple. God had said to him, you will not die <clears throat> until you see the Lord's Christ. And when they presented him at the temple on the eighth day, according to Jewish custom for circumcision, there he was. Now Simeon understood the spiritual ramifications. Simeon was the priest of God's people. Simeon knew the word. Simeon understood what was going on. Simeon had a conversation with God. And now this event was special. For truly, God has appeared. And he, more than any other of these people, got it as did Anna, the 80-year-old woman who was there living in the temple, as she had done almost all of her life. They got it. This is God in flesh. <clears throat> but finally, when God appeared, Mary pondered. Luke 2 says, But Mary kept all of these things in her heart. I think it is interesting how in the background, if you will, Mary was in all of this. I don't, outside of the, the time that she was going to see her cousin who was pregnant with John the baptizer, and she was pregnant as well, and they had a conversation and they discussed, there's not much said about Mary and her thoughts and her actions and other than just doing what a mother does. But it's telling to me but the text says, she kept these things in her heart. I think Mary was a woman of faith. And that is why she acted or reacted the way she did. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Scripture tells us. Mary had heard God. She had given birth to God in flesh. And therefore, more intimately and more connected than anybody else ever could be, she pondered in her heart who this was and what this meant and what was the future going to be. 
Simeon warned her. He told her that there would be a sword to her heart. Because 30 years later, she had to sit at the feet of the cross and watch her child crucified. But because of her heart, she knew what was going on. She understood it. And by faith, she accepted it, lived with it, and left a legacy from it. Those same reactions happen today when people think about the birth of Jesus. Some say, yeah, interesting event. Maybe bigger than it seems, but quite interesting. Some say, Oh, this is so cool. I mean, look at all of the things that sort of come together in a historical fashion. That is so cool. Some just talk about it. What does it mean? I think it means this. What do you think it means? Some are upset. Some don't like it. Some can't stand it. They don't like it because every time an atheist signs a check, he is saying, God came in flesh. Because all of time is dated from the idea, the the, the event of the birth of Jesus. They don't like it. Some fight against it. They're troubled. Others know the spiritual significance of the past. Understand what God was doing all throughout history, beginning now, culminating here and in the death of Jesus. And all people today who have faith accept God at his word, that God appeared in flesh. And because he appeared in flesh, we can have relationship with him and he with us. And we know that we are his people. Every birth is special. But rebirth is more special. And every time a person is born into the family of God through water and spirit, that's a new birth, and it's even better than the first one. And today, if you have not been born again, if you've not obeyed Jesus in baptism, born into the family of God to receive forgiveness of your sins, today... No more special than any other day except for the fact that we're here. You can do it. Or maybe if you need to be faithful to God like you've never been before, ready to start afresh. Today, no more special than any other day except for the fact that we're here. You can decide today to get started over. Can we help you? Can we help you with getting your life where it needs to be. If so, you meet our shepherds at the front as we stand and sing together.